Hey there, welcome back to Story Slices, where we slice through the best Reddit tales just for you. Let's dive right into the first story. The first one is the title story, and it starts like this. It was a beautiful Saturday afternoon in late June when my world turned upside down over a simple backyard barbecue. The sun was shining, birds were chirping, and the smell of grilled burgers and hot dogs filled the air. Little did I know that this innocent family gathering would spark a months-long battle with an overzealous homeowners association that I wasn't even a part of. My name's Mike, and I've lived in my modest two-story house on Elm Street for the past five years. It's a quiet neighborhood on the outskirts of town, right where the newer developments give way to older, established homes. My place is one of those older homes, built in the 1970s before the fancy subdivisions started popping up around us. When I bought the house, I was thrilled to learn that it wasn't part of any homeowner association. I'd heard horror stories from friends about power-tripping board members and ridiculous rules, so I was happy to avoid all that drama. Or so I thought. That fateful Saturday, I invited my family over for a cookout to celebrate my son Tyler's high school graduation. It was nothing fancy, just burgers, hot dogs, and some cold beers for the adults. As I fired up the grill, my wife Sarah brought out a big bowl of potato salad. Smells great honey, she said, giving me a peck on the cheek. The neighbors might get jealous? I laughed. Well, there's plenty to go around if anyone wants to stop by. As if on cue, our next-door neighbor, Bob, poked his head over the fence. Hey Mike, that smells amazing. Mind if I grab a plate? Come on over, Bob. I called back. The more, the merrier. Bob joined us, and soon enough, a few other neighbors wandered over, drawn by the delicious aroma. It was turning into an impromptu block party, and everyone was having a great time. That's when I noticed a woman I didn't recognize standing at the edge of my property, scowling and furiously scribbling something on a clipboard. She was middle-aged, with graying hair pulled back in a tight bun, and wore a crisp white blouse tucked into khaki pants. Everything about her screamed, I want to speak to the manager. I excused myself from the grill and walked over to her. Can I help you? I asked, trying to keep my tone friendly despite her obvious disapproval. She looked up from her clipboard, her lips pursed. Are you the owner of this property? Yes, I am, I replied. Is there a problem? She thrust a piece of paper at me. This is a citation for violation of homeowner association regulations. Barbecues are strictly prohibited in this neighborhood due to fire hazard concerns and smoke nuisance. I blinked, confused. I'm sorry, but there must be some mistake. My house isn't part of any homeowner association. The woman's scowl deepened. Don't be ridiculous. All properties in Sunnyside Estates are subject to homeowner association rules and regulations. Ma'am, I think you're confused, I said, trying to remain calm. This isn't Sunnyside Estates. That development starts two blocks over. My house is older and isn't part of any planned community. She rolled her eyes. I don't have time for your excuses. The citation stands. You have 48 hours to pay the $250 fine and remove all barbecue equipment from the premises. Failure to comply will result in further penalties. Before I could argue further, she turned on her heel and marched away, leaving me standing there with a the citation in my hand, completely dumbfounded. I walked back to the grill, where my brother-in-law Tom was keeping an eye on the burgers. Everything okay? He asked, noticing my expression. I shook my head and showed him the citation. Some lady from the homeowner association just gave me this. Says barbecues are prohibited. Tom's eyebrows shut up. But you're not even in an homeowner association. I know, I exclaimed. I tried to tell her that, but she wouldn't listen. Sarah came over, concern etched on her face. What's going on? I explained the situation to her, and she frowned. That's ridiculous. We need to fight this. I nodded, determined. Oh, we will. I'm not paying a cent or getting rid of my grill. They can't enforce rules on property that isn't part of their association. Despite my resolve, the incident put a damper on the party. I tried to enjoy the rest of the afternoon with my family, but my mind kept wandering back to the citation and the upcoming confrontation I knew was inevitable. The next morning, I woke up early and headed to the county records office as soon as it opened. I wanted to gather all the documentation I could to prove that my property wasn't part of Sunnyside Estates or any other homeowner association. The clerk at the records office, a friendly older woman named Betty, was helpful in my search. Let's see here, she said, peering at her computer screen. Your property at 1425 Elm Street. Yes, it's definitely outside the boundaries of Sunnyside Estates. It's not part of any planned community or subject to any homeowner association covenants. I breathed a sigh of relief. Can I get copies of the property records and a map showing the homeowner association boundaries? Of course, dear, Betty replied, printing out several pages. This should give you everything you need. Armed with the documentation, I headed straight to the Sunnyside Estates Homeowner Association office. It was a small building near the entrance of the subdivision, with a sign that read Sunnyside Estates Homeowners Association in gold letters. I walked in and approached the receptionist, a young woman who looked barely out of her teens. Hi, I need to speak with someone about an incorrect citation I received yesterday. The receptionist looked up from her computer. Do you have an appointment? No, but this is urgent, I replied. 
I was given a citation for a barbecue, but my property isn't even part of this homeowner association. She frowned. I'm sorry, sir, but Mrs. Pemberton, our homeowner association president, only sees residents by appointment. I leaned in, lowering my voice. Look, I understand you're just doing your job, but this is a serious matter. I have documentation proving that a mistake has been made. I'd really appreciate it if you could make an exception. The receptionist hesitated, then nodded. Okay, let me see what I can do. She picked up the phone and had a brief conversation, then turned back to me. Mrs. Pemberton can see you in five minutes. Please have a seat. I sat down in one of the uncomfortable plastic chairs in the waiting area, my leg bouncing with nervous energy. After what felt like an eternity, the receptionist called out, Mrs. Pemberton will see you now. Her office is down the hall, last door on the right. I walked down the hall and knocked on the door. A curt come in sounded from inside, and I entered the office. Mrs. Pemberton was the same woman who had issued me the citation the day before. She sat behind a large desk, her posture rigid and unwelcoming. What seems to be the problem, mister? Daniels. Mike Daniels, I supplied. I'm here about the citation you issued me yesterday for having a barbecue. She nodded, her expression unchanged. Yes, I remember. What about it? I took a deep breath, reminding myself to stay calm. Mrs. Pemberton, there's been a mistake. My property at 1425 Elm Street isn't part of Sunnyside Estates or any other homeowner association. You don't have the authority to issue me citations or fines. Mrs. Pemberton's eyes narrowed. Mr. Daniels, I can assure you that all properties in this area are part of our homeowner association. We don't make mistakes. I pulled out the documents I'd gotten from the county records office and placed them on her desk. I'm afraid you have in this case. These records clearly show that my property is outside the boundaries of Sunnyside Estates. This map, I pointed to the relevant document, shows the homeowner association boundaries, and my house is two blocks away from the edge of your jurisdiction. Mrs. Pemberton's face flushed as she examined the documents. I could see the realization dawning in her eyes, but she seemed reluctant to admit her error. Well, she said stiffly, it appears there may have been some confusion about the exact boundaries of our community. I understand mistakes can happen, I said, trying to be diplomatic. I just want to clear this up and have the citation removed. She pursed her lips, then nodded curtly. Very well, I'll void the citation. Is there anything else? I hesitated, then decided to push my luck a little. Actually, yes, I'd appreciate it if you could provide me with a written acknowledgement that my property is not part of your homeowner association and that you have no authority over it, just to prevent any future misunderstandings. Mrs. Pemberton looked like she'd rather eat glass, but after a moment's consideration, she nodded. Fine, fine, I'll have that drafted and sent to you by the end of the week. Thank you, I said, standing up. I appreciate your cooperation in resolving this matter. As I turned to leave, Mrs. Pemberton called out, Mr. Daniels? I looked back at her. Yes, yes? Her expression was stern. While your property may not be under our jurisdiction, I hope you'll still consider the comfort of your neighbors when engaging in activities like outdoor barbecues. The smoke can be quite bothersome. I bit back a retort and simply nodded before leaving her office. As I walked out of the homeowner association building, I couldn't help but feel a mix of relief and annoyance. The citation issue was resolved, but I had a feeling this wouldn't be the last I'd hear from Mrs. Pemberton and her homeowner association. Over the next few days, I filled Sarah in on what had happened at the homeowner association office. She was relieved that we'd gotten the citation cleared up but shared my concerns about potential future issues. Maybe we should consider putting up a fence, she suggested one evening as we sat on our back porch, just to clearly mark our property line and give us some privacy from nosy neighbors. I nodded, sipping my beer. Not a bad idea. We've been talking about it for a while anyway. This might be the push we needed. As promised, the letter from the homeowner association arrived at the end of the week. It was a formal acknowledgement that our property was not part of Sunnyside Estates and that the homeowner association had no authority over us. I filed it away carefully, just in case we needed it in the future. The following weekend, I decided to have another barbecue, partly to celebrate our victory over the homeowner association and partly out of sheer stubbornness. This time, we invited more neighbors, including Bob and his family from next door. As I was setting up the grill, Bob wandered over, looking a bit nervous. Hey Mike, he said, glancing around. You sure it's okay to be grilling? I heard about what happened with the homeowner association last time. I grinned and showed him the letter from Mrs. Pemberton. No worries, Bob. We're in the clear. Our property isn't part of their precious homeowner association, so they can't tell us what to do. Bob's eyes widened as he read the letter. Wow, that's great. You know, a lot of us in the neighborhood have been getting fed up with the homeowner association's strict rules. Maybe you could give us some pointers on how to stand up to them. I laughed. Happy to help, Bob. Why don't you spread the word? Anyone who's sick of homeowner association drama is welcome to join our cookout today. Bob grinned and headed off to make some calls. By the time the burgers were ready, our backyard was packed with neighbors, many of whom I'd never met before. The atmosphere was festive, with people sharing stories of their own run-ins with the homeowner association and offering advice to each other. As the party was in full swing, 
I noticed a familiar figure standing at the edge of my property. Mrs. Pemberton was back, clipboard in hand, her face a mask of disapproval. I walked over to her, waving the letter from the homeowner association. Good afternoon, Mrs. Pemberton. Is there a problem? She glared at me. Mr. Daniels, while I acknowledge that your property is not under our jurisdiction, I must protest this. Gathering? The noise and smoke are disturbing our residents. I smiled politely. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mrs. Pemberton, but we're not breaking any laws. We're simply enjoying a nice day with our neighbors. You're welcome to join us if you'd like. Her nostrils flared. This is exactly the kind of chaos that homeowner associations are designed to prevent. Mark my words, Mr. Daniels, this won't be the end of this matter. As she stormed off, I couldn't help but feel a mix of satisfaction and unease. We'd won this battle, but I had a feeling the war with the homeowner association was far from over. Over the next few weeks, life returned to normal, or so I thought. Sarah and I went ahead with our plans to install a fence around our backyard, choosing a nice wooden privacy fence that would give us some seclusion from prying eyes. The fence was nearly complete when I received an unexpected visitor one afternoon. I was in the garage, tinkering with my old Chevy, when I heard a knock on the open door. Mr. Daniels? A voice called out. I rolled out from under the car to see a man in a suit standing in my driveway. That's me, I replied, wiping my hands on a rag as I stood up. Can I help you? The man extended his hand. I'm David Miller, an attorney representing the Sunnyside Estates Homeowners Association. Do you have a moment to talk? My heart sank. I should have known the homeowner association wouldn't give up so easily. Sure, I said, trying to keep my voice neutral. What's this about? Mr. Miller pulled out a folder from his briefcase. I'm here to discuss some concerns the homeowner association has about recent activities on your property. While we acknowledge that your home is not officially part of the Sunnyside Estates community, the association believes that your actions are negatively impacting the quality of life for our residents. I crossed my arms. And what actions would those be? Well, he began flipping through some papers. There have been complaints about excessive noise from frequent outdoor gatherings, smoke from barbecues, and most recently the construction of a fence that doesn't meet the aesthetic standards of the neighborhood. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mr. Miller, with all due respect, none of that is the homeowner association's business. My property is not part of Sunnyside Estates, as your client has already acknowledged in writing. We're not subject to their rules or standards. Miller nodded. I understand your position, Mr. Daniels. However, the homeowner association is considering legal action based on nuisance laws. They believe your activities are interfering with the quiet enjoyment of property for Sunnyside Estates residents. I felt my temper rising. Legal action? For having barbecues and building a fence on my own property? That's ridiculous. I'm just here to convey the homeowner association's concerns and explore the possibility of reaching an amicable solution, Miller said, his tone maddeningly calm. Perhaps we could discuss some voluntary guidelines that would address the homeowner association's concerns while respecting your property rights. I took a deep breath, trying to calm down. Mr. Miller, I appreciate you coming here in person but I'm not interested in any voluntary guidelines. My family and I are law-abiding citizens enjoying our property within the bounds of local ordinances. If the homeowner association wants to waste time and money on a frivolous lawsuit, that's their choice. But I can assure you, we'll fight it every step of the way. Miller's professional demeanor slipped for a moment, and I saw a flicker of sympathy in his eyes. I understand, Mr. Daniels. I'll convey your position to my clients. For what it's worth, I hope this can be resolved without legal action. As he turned to leave, I called out, Mr. Miller? He looked back at me. Just out of curiosity, how many other homeowners has the homeowner association threatened with legal action? He hesitated, then said quietly, you're the first, Mr. Daniels. Have a good day. As I watched him drive away, I felt a mix of anger and determination. This wasn't just about me anymore. If the homeowner association was willing to go to these lengths to control a non-member, what were they doing to the people actually under their jurisdiction? I went inside and filled Sarah in on what had happened. She was as upset as I was. This is getting out of hand, she said, shaking her head. What are we going to do? I paced the kitchen, thinking, we need to fight back, but not just for us. I bet a lot of people in Sunnyside Estates are unhappy with the homeowner association but too afraid to speak up. Maybe it's time we gave them a voice. Sarah raised an eyebrow. What do you have in mind? Remember Bob telling us how many people were fed up with the homeowner association? I said, an idea forming. Let's organize a community meeting. Invite everyone, homeowner association members or not. We can share information hear people's stories, and maybe even discuss ways to reform or dissolve the homeowner association. Sarah nodded slowly, a smile spreading across her face. That's not a bad idea, but where would we hold it? The homeowner association controls all the community spaces in Sunnyside Estates. I grinned. Well, we've got a nice big backyard, don't we? And a brand new fence to give us some privacy. Over the next week, Sarah and I worked on organizing the community meeting. We created flyers and discreetly distributed them throughout the neighborhood. We were careful to frame it as an informational meeting about homeowners' rights rather than an anti-homeowner association rally. To avoid immediate pushback? 
The day of the meeting arrived, and I was nervous as I set up chairs in the backyard. Would anyone actually show up, or had the homeowner association's intimidation tactics scared everyone into silence? My worries were unfounded. As the designated start time approached, people began trickling in. First came Bob and his family, then other immediate neighbors. Soon our backyard was filled with faces both familiar and new. I was surprised to see Mr. Miller, the homeowner association's lawyer, slip in quietly and take a seat at the back. He gave me a small nod, which I returned uncertain of his motives for being there. Once everyone was settled, I stood up to address the group. Thank you all for coming, I began, my voice shaky at first but growing stronger. We're here today to discuss our rights as homeowners and the role of the homeowner association in our community. I shared my own experiences with the group, from the initial barbecue citation to the recent legal threats. As I spoke, I saw heads nodding and heard murmurs of agreement. But this isn't just about me, I continued. I want to hear from all of you. What have your experiences with the homeowner association been like? Good or bad, we want to hear it all. At first, there was silence. Then, slowly, people began to speak up. A woman in her 60s talked about being fined for having a bird feeder in her front yard. A young couple shared their frustration at not being allowed to paint their front door the color they wanted. A single dad described his struggle to pay ever-increasing homeowner association fees on top of his mortgage. As more people shared their stories, the atmosphere in the backyard changed. What had started as a group of wary individuals became a community united by shared experiences and frustrations. Towards the end of the meeting, a man I didn't recognize stood up. I've been on the homeowner association board for the past year, he said, his voice trembling slightly. I joined hoping to make positive changes, but the truth is, the system is broken. A small group of people have too much power, and they're more interested in control than in actually improving the community. His words sent a ripple through the crowd. More people began to speak up, not just about problems, but about solutions. There was talk of petitioning for new board elections, of rewriting the homeowner association bylaws, even of dissolving the homeowner association entirely. As the meeting was winding down, Mr. Miller approached me. Mr. Daniels, he said quietly, I want you to know that I'll be advising my clients against pursuing any legal action against you. What I've heard here today? Well, let's just say it's given me a lot to think about. I nodded, grateful for his candor. Thank you, Mr. Miller. I hope the homeowner association listens to your advice. After the last of the attendees had left, Sarah and I sat on our back porch, processing everything that had happened. I think we started something big today, she said, squeezing my hand. I nodded, feeling a mix of excitement and trepidation. Yeah, I think we did. It's not going to be easy, but I believe we can make real change happen. Over the next few months, our little backyard meeting sparked a revolution in Sunnyside Estates. A group of residents, emboldened by the stories they'd heard, started a campaign to recall the current homeowner association board and elect new leadership. They reached out to me for advice and support, and I was happy to help however I could. The existing homeowner association board, led by Mrs. Pemberton, didn't go down without a fight. They sent out strongly worded letters warning of chaos and plummeting property values if the homeowner association's authority was undermined. But their scare tactics fell flat in the face of the community's newfound unity. In a surprising turn of events, Mr. Miller, the homeowner association's own lawyer, played a crucial role in the reform process. He helped the residents navigate the legal complexities of changing the homeowner association's structure and bylaws, ensuring everything was done by the book. Six months after our initial confrontation over the barbecue, Sunnyside Estates held a special election. The results were overwhelming. The old board was out, replaced by a diverse group of homeowners committed to a more balanced and resident-friendly approach. The new board's first act was to review and revise many of the homeowner association's more restrictive rules. The ban on barbecues was lifted, color restrictions on houses were relaxed, and the process for approving home improvements was streamlined. As for me and my family, we were invited to a special barbecue in the Sunnyside Estates Community Park to celebrate the changes. It was surreal to stand there, grilling burgers alongside my former adversaries, now allies in creating a better neighborhood for everyone. Mrs. Pemberton even approached me at the event. Her usual stern expression softened somewhat. Mr. Daniels, she said, I owe you an apology. While I still believe in the importance of community standards, I can see now that our approach was too heavy-handed. Your actions, while disruptive at the time, have ultimately led to positive changes for Sunnyside Estates. I was taken aback by her words but appreciated the olive branch. Thank you, Mrs. Pemberton. I'm glad we were all able to come together for the good of the community. As I looked around at the diverse group of neighbors enjoying the sunny day, children playing, and the smell of grilled food in the air, I couldn't help but feel proud. What had started as a simple backyard barbecue had turned into a movement that brought an entire community together. Sarah came up beside me, slipping her arm around my waist. Penny for your thoughts? She asked. I smiled, pulling her close, just thinking about how sometimes, standing up for what's right can lead to changes bigger than we ever imagined. She laughed, all because you wanted to grill some burgers.
Hey, I chuckled, never underestimate the power of a good barbecue. As we stood there, watching our neighbors and new friends enjoy the day, I realized that this wasn't just about beating an overzealous homeowner association. It was about the power of community, the importance of standing up for your rights, and how small actions can spark big changes. The battle with the homeowner association had been challenging, often frustrating, and at times even a little scary. But looking at the results, a more united neighborhood, fairer rules, and a sense of true community, I knew it had all been worth it. And as I flipped another burger on the grill, savoring the aroma of summer and the sound of laughter around me, I couldn't help but smile. Sometimes the best way to bring people together is over good food and a common cause. In our case, it just happened to be the right to enjoy a simple backyard barbecue. The next one is an entitled people story. A little background, we've been going out since high school, and have a very joke-why relationship. Poking fun for the most part isn't out of the question, though if one of us says we aren't comfortable with one of the jokes, the other makes an effort not to make it again for the most part. More context coming. I have been a bit of an obsessive fan of music artists since I was 14. I have more than one tattoo inspired by this artist and her aesthetic. I have seen her in concert multiple times, I own more merch than I can say, and have run several different fan accounts devoted to her during this time. I understand this is weird. I try not to bring it up in everyday conversation because I am aware it is weird. Most people who know me in passing do not know this about me, and only my best friend and my boyfriend know about my fan accounts. I am not the person who talks about this artist constantly. I am not the person who is annoying in large groups about it. Anymore, there was a learning curve when I was in high school but losing friends is a great motivator to fix yourself. My boyfriend has on and off made jokes about this since we got together. Admittedly, whenever I bring up that it makes me feel insecure and unsafe expressing myself around him, he stops for a while. But he always starts up again, and it just bothers me. I can't fully explain it, but it makes me feel like the things I like are somehow inherently bad, and that he wants me to stop having this interest because he doesn't see value in it. Now he's never said that, and I don't genuinely believe that, but that's how he makes me feel. An example, I had been cleaning dishes, and listening to her music when he came into the kitchen and started singing along in the most high-pitched, off-key falsetto voice I had ever heard before busting up and turning it off and saying something like I don't see how you listen to this crap. This was one of the times I told him that he had hurt my feelings. He apologized, explained that he had only meant it as a lighthearted joke, and that he didn't care what kind of music I listened to. I don't really get mad over this, it more just hurts my feelings. Context out of the way, we were out at dinner with his friends and their girlfriends, and I had left to go to the bathroom, and came back to him showing them a video on his phone, and the audio was familiar right away. It was a performance from over a decade ago that was panned pretty universally. They were all laughing and he was making a lot of jokes, until he noticed I had gone quiet, and said to lighten up. I tried to smile but he wouldn't drop it, and I said, I don't like your music either, but I would never make fun of you for it. You know that? It was a quiet meal, and ride home, and he is now barely talking to me. Two of the girlfriends there said I made everything awkward, and that I was being unfair because we always made jokes with each other. Am I the a-hole? Update, update. So, a lot of people private messaged me and helped me work through everything regarding my now ex, including being a shoulder to cry on when I realized it wasn't going to work out, and I guess I felt I owed them an update if they were interested. Not to mention the great advice I received in the comments on the original. I am deeply thankful to so many of them. A few in particular who disagreed with my take also helped me see where he may have been coming from and helped me to figure out how I was going to talk to him about everything. So I did apologize for bringing it up publicly. I know that many people disagreed with me that I should, but personally, I've always been the type to want to handle any grievances I may have with a loved one privately, rather than publicly, and I didn't like that fact that I allowed myself to break that rule, around his friends no less. He thanked me for that but really didn't want to dig into why he felt the need to make a joke out of it. I asked if it was because I had been bringing her slash her music up more than usual, due to her being active in the media currently, but he denied this. Still, I continued to press, explaining that we needed to move past this one way or another, because if he continued to mock slash ridicule my interests, it was going to make me slowly resent him. Something I really didn't want, but couldn't deny would happen if he continued to act like a bully. Eventually, after a lot of pressure, he explained that this had all started because he had complained to his friends privately about me last year, during the lead up to her album release, and they didn't like the fact that I was a fan of this artist and made some political assumptions about her based on her lyrical content from over 10 years ago, teasing boyfriend for having a wannabe trad wife girlfriend and other things that he was resentful of, including but not limited to asking if I had daddy issues, or if I had a history of sleeping with older men. I am heavily sanitizing the language used, because some of what was said was disgusting honestly. Basically, it boiled down to him trying to shame me into not liking the artist anymore, so he wouldn't have to deal with his friends anymore, rather than just shutting them down. I couldn't be in a relationship like that, I just couldn't. The fact that every time I had felt awful about myself and my interests for the past year, and just thought I was being oversensitive to a joke, 
it was actually the point to make me feel bad, it destroyed any hope I had for the relationship. I won't lie, I've been pretty heartbroken. The breakup was shortly after the first post, and I've just gotten around to updating. So yeah, no big blowout with dramatics, no secret affair, or anything. Just a man trying to make me feel small because he didn't know how to tell his friends to piss off. Boring, but depressing AF. The next one is an entitled people story. I am the oldest of three kids. I'm 26, my brother is 25, and my sister is 9. Our father, who was in the army, passed away two months ago, and our mother died a few years back. My brother and I have always spoiled my sister, and we share a huge bond. When I moved out for university, my sister was very sad. The following year, my brother joined me, which had a huge impact on her. We kept in touch through daily video calls. After graduating last year, I started a good-paying job and met my girlfriend. We hit it off, and shortly after, we became a couple. My sister liked her. When our father died, my brother and I decided that I would take custody of my sister and bring her to live with us in France. She speaks French and attends a French private school, so the transition was smooth. I moved to a bigger house so she could have her own bedroom and bathroom. My girlfriend said she supported me, but yesterday she asked me to move my sister to live with my brother. She didn't want to act like a mother figure, which I understand. I just wanted them to have a healthy, caring relationship since they are both important in my life. I always make sure my sister is taken care of and comes to me for anything. My brother and I handle all her needs, so I'm not leaving any responsibilities for my girlfriend. She said that we're not spending much time together alone, that she wants us to be free, travel and enjoy our relationship. I told her that my sister is not going anywhere, and if she wanted to leave, that was fine. She asked if I am breaking up with her but I didn't answer. I left the restaurant, and she went to her friend's place. I haven't texted her or reached out. Today I woke up to a lot of messages from her friends and her sister, calling me a horrible person, that I should prioritize as my girlfriend. I don't know what she told them, and I didn't reply. I just shut down my phone and focused on work. To clarify something, there is no way I move my sister to my brother's place. And I do spend time with my girlfriend but of course since my sister came, I had to spend more time with her to make sure she's happy. After all, grown people can be destroyed by parents' death, and my sister is only nine and she already lost both parents. And if anyone say I don't love my girlfriend, I really do love her. She is my first real relationship. I think I should have discussed and explained more with my girlfriend instead of just saying one phrase which is let's break up if you can't accept my sister living with me. My brother said that he understand me and support me but if he was in my place, he would have done it differently. He says that I might act it a little cruel, like I don't value my girlfriend or our relationship. Am I the a-hole for handling the situation like I did? Update. Update. First of all, thank you for all your comments and opinions. I made sure to read all of them. I also appreciate everyone who offered their condolences for my parents' deaths. Regarding my sister, physically she is well, but emotionally she is struggling. Some days are better than others. She used to be happy, talkative, and full of energy. Now she is quiet, shy, and anxious. The other day, we went out exploring Paris together, with my brother and his girlfriend. She was very happy and laughing but all this positivity faded the next day. I was considering therapy for her, and now it's a priority. Many of you mentioned therapy in your comments to help her get through her grief and fears, and for that, I thank you. I am now looking for a therapist experienced in such situations. For those concerned about my sister's life and future, I want to say that a few days ago we had a family video call. It was with me, my brother, our grandparents, some uncles and aunts, and my father's lawyer. We discussed my father's inheritance. Since my brother and I have good university degrees and careers, we decided to divide everything left to us from our parents, 50-25-25 in my sister's favor. Her part will be saved in a bank account until she becomes an adult. Additionally, my family is contributing significantly to my sister's account. So, thankfully my sister's financial future is secured. Regarding my girlfriend, we met today after work. She started by apologizing on behalf of her friends and sister. She swore that she didn't push them on me. She was emotional and venting to them and they took it upon themselves to harass me. She actually likes my sister and feels sorry that she had to deal with all this loss at such a young age. She thought since I have a big family, I might accept giving them my sister's custody. She is not ready for that responsibility. This time, I listened to her until she finished, acknowledged her worries and demands, but simply I don't agree. I told her that my sister is staying and will require the majority of my time until she gets used to her new life. That's why it will be unfair for me to stay in a relationship without being able to invest time and effort in it. We broke up in a respectful way, wishing each other the best. My life has changed drastically. I now have many responsibilities. Parenting, disciplining, school. I need to get used to my new single parent life. Until then, I am not going to enter a new relationship for the sake of myself, my sister, and my future partner. The next one is an entitled people story. So, as the title says, he's terrified of having sex with me. We've been together for almost six months now, and every time I attempt to get intimate, he's never initiated, he always manages to deflect so smoothly, I don't even realize at the moment. He's fine with kissing and cuddling, 
and about 50% of the time he just walks up and kisses me while I'm doing something, or just grabs me to cuddle, but if I take it further, he'll change the topic or the mood. Like, if we're watching a movie or something, and I start feeling him up, he'll turn it into play wrestling, and after we're done, I'm usually too sweaty or tired to have sex. I'm cool if he's waiting until marriage or something, because other than this one thing, he's an otherwise amazing person but I just need him to say that. None of this weird deflection stuff that's driving me mad. If at any point he'd said, I don't want to have sex for X reason, I'd have either accepted it or broken up with him. I've been single long enough to know how to look after myself, so it's not like I need him to sleep with me. We used to only see each other on weekends, but I haven't tried anything since he moved in a month ago, because I realized that I'd just get turned down, and I know how annoying it feels to be harassed into having sex. Before anyone starts with a red flag girl, break up with him, or some crap, He's a great boyfriend in person. He's thoughtful, loving, smart. He's working towards his PhD in biochemistry, and also super attractive. This weekend, we both got kind of drunk, me more than him, and for whatever reason, he was looking so sexy that I couldn't resist myself. He kissed me, and instead of just kissing him back normally, I shoved my hand down his pants. It was like I electrocuted him. He jerked away, and the expression on his face was one of pure terror, and I didn't really realize that until this morning. I just thought I accidentally scratched him down there or something. He just quietly put away the drinks, and pushed me to bed. We usually sleep together, but just sleep. I passed out afterward, and I think he slept in the guest bedroom, but I don't know, because he's really good at cleaning things up, and I woke up around 1pm with a super hazy memory. The only reason I realized that that night was real, was because he ducking flinched when I kissed him after lunch, he made really good scrambled eggs, and he's been a bit more, I guess wary, around me when I hug him, or crawl into his lap to cuddle, normal stuff that he was fine with. Like, if my hand even goes near his thighs, he'll shift away, or hold my hands, or something else. And I don't even know how to bring it up, because it's such a weird question. Do I just ask him, why don't you want to have sex with me? From previous experience with my exes, blunt questions usually don't go over well, and I don't want to tank this relationship over something so simple. Update, update. Before we get into the update, I want to answer a few questions. Why did you let him move in? Because his rent was going up by like $250 a month at the end of last year. He would be locked in a six-month contract, and I own my apartment. I'm giving him a 50% discount on his old rate because of a boyfriend discount I made up. He wanted to pay me the full amount, but I refused, and he decided to do most of the chores around the house, so it's fine. So far, no problems. Why did you never talk about sex before? I just felt super awkward talking about it so clinically. And as one of the commenters mentioned, I wanted sex to happen organically, not because I pestered him into doing it. Now on to the update itself. I started off with an apology about what I did on Saturday again, and he waved it off just like last time, saying that I was drunk and it was just a shock. I still don't believe it was sexual assault like most of you say, and more of me reading the situation wrong, but it was wrong of me to do it when I knew he didn't want to take it any further than kissing. Then I started to poke into why he doesn't want to have sex with me, and like one of the commenters said, I made it more gentle. I said it almost word for word what Lord B. Wood said, and his response broke my heart. Fortunately, it isn't because he's gay, asexual, a virgin, or has a micropenis. He started off by going quiet, and it took a little more probing before he asked me not to laugh, and I feared it was the micropenis, but it was far worse. This man was Saeed twice, once as a teenager by a teacher, which would also be pedophilia, and once a few years ago at a party. And both times, no one really took him seriously, and some of them ducking congratulated him on getting with the women. He tried to go to the cops the first time, and they made his life so much of a living hell that his family moved towns. And the second essay was almost just as bad. My boyfriend is a six foot two, somewhat fit, and very attractive man. So the girl who sighed him at a party basically blackmailed him into having sex with her by saying that she would scream rape, and no one would believe it was him who's innocent. And because no one other than his parents really took the event seriously, he thought that I would laugh at him too. Obviously I didn't, and at this point he was kind of crying, so I just hugged him and we sat there like that for a while. Honestly, the only reason I reacted so calmly was because after reading the comments I prepared myself for him to say he got Saeed. Thanks for that, because I probably would have panicked and ruined my relationship otherwise. I apologized again, now that I knew his history, and he said that it brought back memories, and that's why he reacted like that. Now I feel horrible, and he doesn't seem to hold a grudge, but I'm still going to do something really nice for him. He always wanted to go to skiing, so maybe I could book a weekend at a nearby mountain the next time he's free. I asked if he was open to having sex with me, and he said that he's been trying ever since he moved in, but he was also terrified that he would have like a breakdown or something, and that's why he's been giving mixed signals. Every time we sleep together he wants to do more than just sleep, but he's just been afraid. I said that I was willing to wait however long it took, and suggested therapy, but therapist wait lists here are really long, especially for the ones we found who deal with trauma, so I don't know how long that would take. We both promised to actually talk to each other, 
and I also reassured him that I would always take any problems he is seriously and not laugh, even if he thinks it's shameful. Things are looking up. He wants to have sex with me, and we're going to take it slow for now to sort of ease him into it, so maybe I'll set up something romantic this weekend and woo him. I cooked him some of his favorite food for dinner, and now he isn't tensing up when I touch him, so baby steps. Anyway, thank you guys for the advice, because while I was worrying about the micropenis or gay thing, sexual assault never actually crossed my mind, so thanks for the help. The next one is an entitled people story. My boyfriend, 26M, and I, 24F, have been in a relationship for two years and just got engaged last week. The engagement itself was wonderful, but I couldn't help but notice how similar it was to a conversation I had with my best friend, 23F, of over a decade, a conversation that happened many years ago, in which she detailed exactly what she would do if she proposed to me, and it was very specific to my general likes and interests. And I mean, specific? At the time I told her that sounds perfect and hold on to that for later. It's pretty clear to me that he did approach her, and she let him know about this plan. So, after the day itself, I told my new fiancé that it was cute that he asked her how I wanted to be proposed to, but I joked that he stole her entire, very detailed plan, so it was more her proposal than his. He went quiet, and then got angry, then it all came out. He said that he always felt second place to my best friend, that I was only marrying him to satisfy my religious family, that I've been lying about my preferences and that I'm probably having an affair with my friend. I was shocked. He's never expressed this to me before. He's complained in the past that I spend too much time with her, so I accommodated for his needs as best as I could without losing my best friend, but I had no idea he thinks I'm having an affair. I tried to reassure him but I thought it would be better to leave and told him that we would talk about it later. We haven't been in contact, and though I haven't told my best friend about this, others in my life think that he was completely valid for blowing up, and I need to do all I can to fix this relationship. Was I an a-hole for making that joke? Update. I would like to start by saying thank you to everyone who responded to this post. It put things into better perspective for me. I apologize to my partner, not just for the joke, but for making him feel the way that I did. I keep receiving messages asking for updates, so I just wanted to hop on and clarify a few things that I didn't want to talk about before. I was asked about my orientation, I identify as asexual and my partner is straight. We had a great low intimacy relationship. I stayed loyal throughout our relationship. We discussed how this was going to work at length when we were first together, and often talked about boundaries, so I didn't think this was a big problem. Turns out it was. Someone found this post and sent it to him. He found it funny enough to show to our mutual friends, but in doing that, he accidentally showed his own Reddit account. After some digging, they saw that he had a very different set of views to what I previously thought, and was involved in quite a few incel-ish posts in different communities. Apparently he had suspicions for a while that I had been lying to him about my preference and I was a lesbian, but he thought I would change my mind over time. This came as a total shock to me. A lot of people showed confusion over his behavior, including me, and now this information has come out. It makes more sense that he was letting go of grievances he had been holding on to for a while. Needless to say the relationship is done. I gave the ring back and offered to pay for the cost of the proposal, which he declined. I think it's ultimately for the best. And to you, because I'm sure you're going to read this, thank you for everything. I hope that we can both learn and grow from this separately, and I wish you all the best in that. As for whether I'm going to dramatically elope with my best friend, I doubt it. We're like sisters. She's been happily married to a lovely man for the last three years. We're just close I guess. Anyway, thank you all again for your, sometimes brutal, honesty in this. All in all, things worked out for the best. The next one is an entitled people story. So this is fresh, probably too fresh to post anything. But I don't really have any family or people to talk to so, here it goes. GF just ended our four-year relationship after I did some poking and prodding. We have a house, a life, I just finished saving for a ring last week. Tomorrow we have reservations for our four-year anniversary, and I'm hyperventilating a bit. The story is a little complicated. She's had a hereditary disease her whole life. We started dating when she was in remission of sorts, and she got sick again about a year in. It's been a mess of new drugs, sickness, health, etc. for her. We've made it through together. It made our bond very strong. I own my own business, so I was able to work and support us both when she couldn't work her full-time job. However, this business found me pretty successful at a young age. I fell into a deep, deep depression. She helped me through that just by being there, but it's been rough. I gained back 90 of the 100 pounds I lost in high school, drank heavily, I became much more withdrawn, I lost my lust for life, all for a business. She's always been the type to never speak up. She never wants to upset anyone to a fault she was walked all over in past relationships, jobs, etc. I pushed as hard as I could to figure out simple things, like what she wants to eat for dinner. Her doctors had a note not to trust what she says because she's oftentimes more sick than she says she feels. About 18 months ago we made the decision to move, after living together for a year, out of the city. The city was killing us, and we picked out a house in our dream location. I purchased it knowing full well it's not smart to own a house with an SO. You're not married to. 
we made the decision she'd finally quit her job and go back to school for a career she loves, it took her our whole relationship to do so. I've been supporting us 100% the whole time, without her asking, she's always felt terrible about it. This change kicked me out of my depression. We were in a place that I could thrive in, she could go to school and work and we could have a family. I hired people, started working a normal schedule, stopped drinking heavily, and most importantly my focus was life again not business. I was living for experiences. She loved the change in me. We were more active. She dove into school, and all was good. We talked heavily about marriage, had a rough time frame, everything was going really great. Then she got sick in October. Like, really sick? Six weeks in the hospital, I hired extra people and commuted five hours a day to see her, only missing three days. She ultimately had surgery and has been recovering at home the past month, able to get out and about a bit. I noticed a change as she was in the hospital. She wasn't excited to see me. I started having panic attacks when I got home due to the hours and schedule. I had thoughts of overwhelming dread that she was actually falling out of our relationship. We talked about it, and she assured me that was not the case, and through some reading I found that these thoughts were part of the depression I thought was gone. As she's been home recovering, I've done everything I can. I noticed our sporadic conversations about the future stopped, she turned away or changed the subject when I mentioned kids. She never kissed me. I had to kiss her. No hugs. No nothing. So finally tonight I just pushed her. I could only ask you, okay? So much as I had the past four months. She broke. She said she had a lot of time to think in the hospital. She said she wasn't living for herself, and she needs to find herself, and she feels horrible because for four years I've pushed her daily to find her passions and follow them, not to think of others first in such an extreme. I did this because that's what I do, I work my dream job, and I want that for her. She says she feels like she's holding me back, she loves me. And I think I believe that because she's refusing to let me settle. But damn, do I still love her? Most upsetting, she said that she's never felt at home in our house. She's felt like it was always mine, and she was a girlfriend staying over. I pressed this issue before we moved, asking her where she'd like to live. Anywhere in the world. I can work from anywhere. She said this was a great idea. Please know that I've also got no design sense. I'm just the muscle. So it's not a matter of my stuff being all over the place. She's decorated very nicely. So here I sit. Sober. Crying. Fat with no one to call, no close family or friends in 120 mile radius. I can't bring myself to open the door to the office I just built out for her new career, and the paint is literally drying from earlier tonight. We moved to a family area, no more college scene. I read advice to throw yourself into work, and I have a job that almost killed me once, and I will be alone in this house that was, in two to three years, meant for our family. Money is not an issue. I love the area. I love our home, and I do not wish to leave. It truly is my dream to live here but it was my dream to live here with our family that we had planned. Life lesson. Nothing is set in stone. So how do I even start to cope? We still love each other. We're best friends. I'm going up to sleep in our bed because I can't bring myself to sleep in the guest room and she doesn't want me to. She's going to stay while we untangle our life, and she, along with my family and hers, are afraid of what I'll do to myself. I'm not going anywhere, I've never been suicidal, but I sure as hell can't drink this one away because the drinking won't stop. But she's going to leave, like, soon. I know it's not fair to hold on to the idea that she might just need to do some soul-searching and come back. And I know that, being so sick for so long, she really didn't have a chance to figure out what she wanted. But I just can't help but feel absolutely gutted that it took this long for it to come out, because I can't see my life without us. It's the most life-shattering thing I've ever felt. Update 1. The past 24 hours have been a beautiful and sad journey. After the initial shock wore off, we've done a lot of talking, and for the first time we've been completely honest with each other at the same time. We've been waiting and waiting for our relationship to fit into the life we've built around it. We've had a hard go at it with the sicknesses, depression, and ultimately the transitional time in our lives. It was a hard time for everyone around us, getting out of college and finding ourselves. We both care so much for each other that we tried to force it to work, ultimately denying our own desires in the process. Personally, I admitted to myself that I am more afraid to be alone in this house and area than I am. Upset our time living together is ending. I have struggled with this since we moved here 18 months ago, because this is my dream. However, I've had serious doubts about our relationship, and the thing that kept me from saying anything was a fear of the unknown, a fear of living alone, as an adult, for the first time in my life. XGF was very clear that it's not fair for me to feel guilty about the life I've built, and this is very true. Likewise, it is not fair to blame her for not wanting the same life. I do wish she had spoke up sooner, but ultimately I love her for trying to make it work because she wanted me to be happy. XGF simply does not know what she wants. She thought she wanted a house, kids, and a family. And when they started coming she realized that she didn't know what she wanted, she only knows that she doesn't know what she wants. We are both adamant that life is too short to settle. This is important. We've been living as best friends for a long time now, years maybe. Saying this out loud was a relief, because it does no mean either of us want our relationship to end it, 
just needs to evolve into its proper state. We decided to take the week to pack our stuff up and while it is sad, it's amazing to be with each other now that this is in the open. Sure, there is the initial feeling of hatred at everything that reminds us of the relationship, because it's a hard thing to close an overall happy time in your life when you know it's for the best. But this is not an angry breakup, and it's been important to realize that the memories of these objects are all good memories. When the sweeping feelings of fear and sadness go away, happiness will remain. I've come to realize that it's not healthy to fill a void in oneself with a relationship. My biggest fear is being alone because I don't yet know how to do that. This relationship became a way for me to fill that void and avoid the fear. I know the process is just starting, and I know there will be some hard days ahead, but I have a feeling that I felt much more alone in our relationship the past year than I will outside of it. XGF and I aren't denying that we are very good friends, so this isn't goodbye. It's a change in living situation, and a new personal journey for the both of us. And so life goes on. I've started the hunt for the right therapist, and my short-term plan is to get through moving her out. I will admit that the thought of taking her key is terrifying, and I'll miss the small things like the tampon box in the closet and the shoes all over the entry. But as time passes I think this sadness will reside, and only happy memories will remain as we reminisce and catch up over lunch someday soon. Update 2. I didn't know what to expect from this event, because I had been dreading it for over a year. It's fair to say that the anxiety, worry, and pain it caused in that time ran my life. I didn't take inventory of this worry though until we separated. Today I find myself with a familiar pit in my stomach, the one that's become a companion of sorts since we bought the house, and then remember that there is nothing to worry about, it's done, and I truly feel much better. I have a lot of anxiety about the future. I have to come to terms with the fact that I've been preparing for marriage and a child in serious ways, and that plan is on hold. XGF and I have been living together since we decided to part ways a couple days ago. We didn't know what else to do. It just felt wrong and inappropriate to rip the band-aid after such an amicable decision. But I think we were both skeptical that it wasn't a good idea. It turns out it was the best thing we could have done, because it took some time for us to open up and ultimately resolve this entire thing. Last night I came home after being out most of the day letting her pack. She hadn't got much done, just kind of started a few chores and was visibly shaken. She saw me and started crying, because, I would find out later, she really thought I was making up the hole. We've been living as best friends thing to get her through the move out. She sees how much I do love and a care for her, and it upset her because she thought she would be breaking my heart. It's important to note that this illustrates her issues. Putting others ahead of yourself is mostly a good thing. But when you value the simple happiness of those around you over your long-term emotional well-being, to the extent it affects your quality of life, it's unhealthy. I recognized this, and was hell-bent on making sure she wasn't staying the rest of the week just for me. This was the catalysts for probably the most honest and healing talk we've ever had. We sat on the couch for hours, talking about us and what happened. Ultimately she saw that I was completely honest with her, and that changed everything we had both felt the same way for so long. Once that thin veil of a romantic relationship was lifted and the expectation was gone, we instantly opened up and have actually been closer than we've ever been. It's strange and unexpected, but I think it's very welcomed from both sides. We have a very special relationship, it just isn't romantic. I think the most complicated thing about this situation is how simple it is. We are two people that fell in love, and that love transformed into the love of two close friends over time. We saw it all the way to the end, as far as we could go before a refused proposal ruined our relationship. We tried, it just didn't work in that way. She told me that she had waited for months because she had no idea her feelings were mutual. Years of business have taught me not to wear my heart on my sleeve, and while I lived with these thoughts I was very careful not to show my hand. Why? It's complicated. Our relationship was an ebb and flow of emotion. She was extremely sick at times, and extremely healthy at other times. I was the same with my depression. I have always been her main caregiver during this, and those doubts became hard to justify as true or circumstantial for both of us. Our relationship was very much that of a parent and child at times. It became a waiting game. It's not easy to think straight when you're spending 40 hours in the car six weeks in a row with your life on hold, or working a job you hate because you don't want to upset your co-workers by leaving. As we always experienced periods of health after the sickness, there was always a light at the end of the tunnel. We both care for each other so much and understood sickness that we didn't want that to be a determining factor in our future healthy lives. So we both waited. In the spurts of good health we continued to build the life we thought we wanted, never stopping to assess the one determining factor together. Our relationship. We simply thought we needed to see the big picture, and in a way I think we did. Now that the life is set up, there are no doubts in either of our minds. We talked a lot about the timing, because she felt terrible it came up when she was in the hospital and around the holiday. Keep in mind she had thought this was one-sided, so she had wanted to say something but didn't want to ruin this time of year. I think this was the first time she really knew I was being truthful when I said I felt the same way, and there has never been a good time to do this. She said she felt guilty because she wanted us to see each other's families one last time. This was a green light for my ultimate conclusion that we weren't crazy, 
this had simply turned into a great friendship. I asked her, if we were old friends from college, what would have been different about our holiday? She and I both spend days with other friends, families this time of year. And besides, maybe sharing a bed instead of taking the floor, there was no difference. We are very close friends with each other's family members, and none of those relationships have to change. I think in the end, we are going to go on to stay good friends with very little break because that's what we've been for two years. We both think our friendship will grow now that the awkward expectation of romance no longer exists, and we're mutually happy about it. I am very scared to be alone, and that is my next big adventure. It's going to be one day at a time, and I am not looking for a big break until I venture on to start the family hunt from zero. But I know that I have to be okay here by myself to have any sort of chance at a healthy relationship in the future, so that's what I'll do first. Final update. Today she moved out of our home. We always called it a home but I don't think we ever got there, I think it was still just a house to both of us. Her whole family decided to come. We are very close, and I've always felt closer to them than almost my entire real family. A lot of my pain did not come from our separation because there truly is no heartbreak there. We love each other deeply, but it is a familial love. It has not been romantic love for a long time. My pain came from the thought I was losing part of my family. Their friendship, their intelligence, and their love are all things I've come to feel are my own. And so they came to help her, sure, but they also came to support me. They came to hug me and cry with me, and to let both of us know that this is not crazy but the most mature and perfect thing to do. They came to make sure I knew we'd be sailing and laughing around the dinner table very soon. Mostly they came to move her things into the truck and then to move my extra stuff from the basement to the empty spaces. They did this out of love, and I felt that deeply all day today. This whole experience sounds like bullcrap to most, and if I were reading this I would agree. What happens when one of us moves on and starts seeing someone else? We don't know. But we do know that we both want to see the other happy, and we've both lived in this relationship with so much guilt watching the other compromise to try and make it fit. In the days that followed our decision to separate we felt a lot of things. It took a lot of time for us to sort through years of buried thoughts and emotion. We did that, lifting the pressure of romance and embracing the warmth of close friendship. And I'm glad we had our week because I don't think our relationship has ever been better. Ultimately we are doing this for the right reasons, and we are doing it for very similar reasons. I have a lot of unresolved issues, and my alone time in the past has led to drinking issues and depression, because I just didn't have the skills to conquer it. I am afraid to be alone, I can't build a healthy relationship until I learn how to do this. I have been debating our relationship for years against being alone, and while it wasn't the correct decision it was always the easy one. I spent years taking care of her, and it was out of love, but it was also because taking care of myself was harder. This is wrong and not fair to myself or her. She has never been alone and has seeked the happiness and validation of others to bring herself happiness. She has stayed in situations not for herself but for others involved because of this. She went to the college her parents wanted and stayed because her roommate wanted her to. She was destroyed in previous relationships because she put her needs second and was walked all over. She stayed in horrible jobs for years because she didn't want to inconvenience her superiors by having to hire a new person. She moved up here for me because she did not know what she truly wanted. She will not be successful in a relationship until she can put herself first and know that she is not compromising herself for the other person. And she was able to finally recognize that because of our relationship. There is no denying that our time together has been the best of both our lives, and there is absolutely a great sadness that it is over. This is not jargon to avoid that. As we separated and untangled our stuff, we were regaining our own individuality and independence. This week there was a lot of crying but the tears were happy, and we've had so many good experiences that we've both grown into better people because of the other. Reliving the past four years was therapeutic and beautiful. It brought us closer together as friends, and we celebrated that this experience will only get better from here. We have a long road ahead, and our first lesson is that we are not we anymore. I am me, and she is herself. We have both spent a long time living one life, and we both agree that while it probably isn't what two perfect emotional people would do, it was an amazing experience that we wouldn't change. We both became better people because of each other, and that's a successful relationship in my book. But it is no longer our house, our bedroom, or our fridge. It is mine, because I live alone now. It is important for me not to cry every time I slip and say we, because I do not yet have any eye memories. That will come next and as scary as it might be I am excited. I will make my house a home, I will not drink to bury the fear, and I will begin therapy and move past my demons. I look forward to learning the fine art form of me. I thank you all for the support this week Reddit. You have been very kind, and I think this will be my last update for the time being, as I take on the next chapter of an already incredible life. The next one is an entitled people story. My friend Sophia, 28F, is upset at me, 27M, for telling her boyfriend Noah that I am not her best friend. I am really lost on what I did wrong, and why I am getting the blame for the fallout. 
Sophia and I met due to a common friend, and have known each other for the last five years. Sophia has been a good friend, and we would generally hang out on weekends with the rest of our friends. Sophia also lived in the same apartment complex as me, and we would sometimes hang out at my apartment, along with other friends to watch TV. Sophia started dating Noah around six months ago. I noticed that Sophia started messaging me more than normal about random stuff like TV shows, music, etc. around the same time, and would send me memes and TikToks all the time. She also messaged me if I want to hang out at my place after work during random weekday evenings. I would generally say no, unless more friends wanted to join in. On Saturday night we were all at my friend's apartment for a party. Sophia and one of my friends left to pick up food, and Noah came to me and asked if we can talk for a few minutes. Noah told me that being a guy I should understand, and he is uncomfortable about my friendship with Sophia. I asked him why, and he said that he understands we are best friends, but he is uncomfortable with her always texting me late at night, or hanging out with me at my apartment on nights when he is busy. He said that he has discussed it with Sophia many times, but she has told him that she will not tolerate him controlling how she behaves with her best friend. He said that he is getting very serious about his relationship with Sophia, and if he should know something before, he commits with his whole heart. The truth is Sophia, and I are good friends, but we are not best friends. She is just one of the eight girls in my friends group that I hang out with, and never have we shared any deep personal secrets about ourselves. I told Noah that he has nothing to worry about. I told him that I would not refer to Sophia as my best friend. In fact, before she started dating Noah, we would barely message each other. I also told him that I never hang out with Sophia alone, and she only visits my place when other friends are invited. Noah asked me if we ever dated or hooked up in past. I told him that Sophia brought up the subject five years ago, but I told her why I would not want to date her, and we never talked about it again. Noah asked me why Sophia would refer to me as her best friend then, and I told him that I also find that weird, because we are good friends, but definitely not best friends. Noah thanked me for being honest, and the night went on. Yesterday afternoon I got a call from Sophia, and she was really mad at me. She asked me what I told Noah, and I told her about our conversation. She told me I was an a-hole to tell Noah that we are not best friends, and how I messed up her relationship. I told her I did not say anything bad about her, and in fact, soothed his concerns that there was anything going on between us. She told me that they had a big fight the night after the party, and Noah confronted her about why would call me her best friend, and tell him that you were at my apartment alone, when none of those things happened. She told me that I should have just backed up her story. Seems like they're having a big fight about her lying to him. I feel bad for Sophia, as I really feel they both are cute together and Noah really likes her. Sophia has also told us how much she adores Noah, and that they are happy together. It's hard for me to understand why Sophia would lie to Noah that we are best friends, and we hang out alone together when he is busy. Am I wrong to tell Noah that Sophia and I are not best friends and should I have just played along? I am not really sure I even understand why I messed up or what to do at this point. Update, update. I posted yesterday about my friend lying to her boyfriend that I was her best guy friend, when in reality, we are just friends and she only started messaging me after she started dating her BF. She adores her boyfriend, and it was confusing to me why she would do that. Turns out Sophia is a genius mastermind, and I am scared. Thanks for the responses on helping me think why she might be doing it. I just wanted to post an update because she came to my apartment and talked to me about the whole situation. She said some unkind things to me on Sunday after I told Noah, her BF, that we were just friends, and definitely not best friends as she is trying to portray me to be. Moreover, I also told him that I never hang out with her alone, and it's generally with a group of friends, as she had also lied about this to him. Yesterday evening, Sophia messaged me to apologize for the outburst, and asked if we could meet, and she can explain why she did that. I told her okay, and she came to my apartment. She told me that she loves Noah, and he is really a good boyfriend. However, he is not very motivated and lazy. When they started dating, he was not really putting a lot of effort in the relationship, and she had to ask him for everything. It used to bother her a lot. She knew that Noah's last girlfriend cheated on him and it took him two years before he started dating again. Noah was very insecure about dating her, and asked her to make sure she shares everything with him. Sophia said that Noah is a great guy, but she needed him to be a better boyfriend. So, she thought she would make Noah jealous by talking to me. She said it worked and Noah started reading our messages. She knew I would not flirt back with her because I have explicitly told her I am not interested in her, and so she thought I was a safe choice. She said Noah kept on asking her why she is talking to me so often, and she told him that I am her best friend, and she needs the emotional support and stability I provide since Noah is not emotionally available for her. That made Noah start replying to her messages quickly, and also being more present in the relationship. 
Noah also wasted his evenings playing video games with his friends and ignored her. So, she would message me on those days and ask if she can hang out with me. She lied to Noah that we would just sit in my apartment and watch movies since he was unavailable, and it used to bother him. He asked her to stop, but she told him that he can play his games and she can have a fun evening with me. Noah repeatedly asked her to cut contact with me or, at least not hang out with me alone in my apartment, and eventually stopped playing video games with his friends so he can hang out with her in evenings. She would also lie to him about how I cooked elaborate meals for her, and we had wine and painting nights, which led Noah do the same. Finally, she told me that I was an o-hole to not go with her story and tell Noah the truth. Noah, of course got angry at her and saw that it was an act to get to change him. Sophia was so proud of her latest lie. She told Noah that I played down our relationship because I was trying to protect Sophia. She told him that I am such a great guy, and was just trying to make sure that my best friend's relationship was not affected because of me. I told her that I was not really happy being a pawn in her lie. She told me that it was a genius idea and there are no victims. She got what she wanted, and Noah is a much better boyfriend thanks to me. And she will now show Noah how much she loves him by slowly reducing messages to me, which he would appreciate, while still thinking of me as a threat that Sophia can fall back on if he changes his loving behavior. She pleaded me to just keep quiet for her sake as she is so happy with the way Noah is now. I thought about it and agreed with her. It feels weird that she is literally training Noah like a lab monkey and behaving the way she wants, but at the end of the day, he seems to have become a better boyfriend thanks to Sophia's plan. I was conflicted on what to do, but I will just go with the act for Sophia's sake as Noah also likes her, and there is no reason to mess things up for them. I would like to hear neutral opinions on if I am wrong with helping Sophia lie to Noah, as it seems like it has made their relationship better and Sophia seems to be happy. The next one is an entitled people story. My sister Claudia and I are not close, very low contact, always family related. Around 14, her, and 17 me, she stole my boyfriend, 16 M, by giving up more physically than I was willing to. After that kind of betrayal, I've never trusted her fully, and have kept my partners distant from her. I'd like to be clear that it's not just this event alone, but this was the major event that made me pull back from her. This awful behavior has continued throughout Claudia's life. She's stolen the boyfriends of several, three that I know of, of her, now ex, friends, and always seems to get bored as soon as the guy leaves his partner for her. Claudia is not a very nice person, but she is superficially charming and makes a good first impression. Twice now at work Claudia has seduced her, married, supervisor, this has happened with two different people at two different jobs, and caused an absolute crap show that ended up in the guys resigning. I have no idea what happened to their home situations, but it couldn't have been good. Claudia thrives on drama and absolutely loves it. I've suggested counseling, but was shot down, I'd have to have a problem to need counseling. Claudia likes the chase more than anything else and there's nothing wrong with that. She justifies her behavior with anyone that didn't want to cheat, wouldn't cheat. You can see why we don't talk much. My friend Brennan, who I met through a previous job, is now in the same industry as Claudia, and Claudia recently found that Brennan's company is hiring. Brennan is sort of HR for the small company Claudia is interested in, and Claudia has applied. Brennan sent an email, I should note, it was from his personal address, not his company account, asking if I could vouch for Claudia, and I'm stuck now. Claudia can absolutely do this job. She will be great at it, except for the fact that she will probably ruin someone's marriage in the process. The fact that she's done this at two-thirds places she's worked long-term since college is uncomfortable, and there are six times I personally know of that she's done this. Claudia is currently single. I don't know what to do, but I'm leaning to not replying to the email and calling Brennan to give my honest opinion that she would be an excellent technical fit but a disaster socially. That way it's not in writing, and Brennan can still be told. But, I'm directly sabotaging my sister's prospects if I do that. But again, I'm directly sabotaging Brennan if I don't tell him what Claudia is liable to do. Claudia will pass any screen they give her. She's charming and has no record of any kind. Would I be the a-hole if I told Brennan my sister would be a great technical fit, but would be a social disaster? Update, update. I called Brennan. It had been nearly a day since his email when I posted. Turns out the reason he reached out. To me is because Claudia passed her screening slash reference check with the company, but Brennan had final say because he was going to be working with her directly on some policy stuff, and so he had to like who they were hiring. Brennan had been hearing rumors going on around about Claudia as well, and wanted to reach out to me to ask me if I'd be honest with him and tell him if they were true, and if working with Claudia was going to be a nightmare for him. This is where my tightrope walk began. I said that I couldn't discuss any rumors relating to my sister with a potential new workplace as that would be inappropriate. I said that I refused to give a reference on her as I've never worked with her and she is family. I said I hoped he understood. 
Brennan thanked me and said he wouldn't be hiring her after my refusal. I panicked a bit, realizing I may have just cost her this job. He said it wasn't my refusal personally, but the rumors flying around were too much of a risk when he has a candidate with 90% of Claudia's abilities slash experience and none of the potential drama. Brennan said if I'd been willing to vouch for Claudia or if either of the other two personal contacts he had panned out to reply about her, he might have taken the leap. Everyone declined slash refused and that was a pattern to him. Brennan then freaked out a little that he might have said too much, so both of us were just sort of in an anxiety hoedown for a bit while awkwardly comforting the other. The end of the call was super cringy and embarrassing. I imagine it will be a while before we speak again. So it appears my sister's drama has cost her a job offer, but I now feel incredibly guilty because I could have been the one to stand up for her and make her get the job. I didn't. I haven't heard from my sister about it and doubt I will. Brennan was not the one to interview her or reject her. He met her on one group call so I don't think she will even consider him or me as the reason for this. Thanks everyone for your help in dealing with this neatly. Are you hungry for more slices of stories? Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to never miss out on any videos. See you tomorrow at Story Slices.